Hekigan Roku, Case 52, Joshu Stone Bridge. Main subject. A monk said to Joshu, the stone bridge of Joshu is widely renowned, but coming here, I find only a set of stepping stones. Joshu said, you see only the stepping stones and do not see the stone bridge. The monk said, what is the stone bridge? Joshu said, it lets donkeys cross over and horses cross over. Secho's verse, no show of transcendence, but his path was high. If you've entered the great sea of Zen, you should catch a giant turtle. I can't help laughing at all at old Kanke, his contemporary, who said, it is as quick as an arrow, a mere waste of labor. Happy Hoenji Day. As I considered this anniversary session, 25 years, my mind kept returning to one thing, and that is our teachers. Without our teachers, without the lineage, there would be no transmission, no Dharma, no anniversary, no Hoenji. And when we think of this, how much have been said about teachers, how does a great Zen master catch a giant turtle? How are true students of Zen acquired? In this case, Joshu acted like an ordinary man. He used plain words, ordinary language, and showed no sign of transcendence. He appears as an insignificant looking monk, yet those who come to him will be helped across the river of samsara the river of birth and death. Dogen Zenji commented on this. Uh, these words are from the treasury of the true Dharma eye. For the transmission of Buddha Dharma, the teacher should be a person who has merged with realization. Scholars concerned with words and letters cannot do it. This would be like the blind leading the blind. Those within the gate of the Buddha ancestors' authentic transmission, venerate and accomplish the death who has attained the way and merge with realization and entrust this master with the upholding of Buddha Dharma. Accordingly, when the spirit beings of the visible and invisible realms come to pay homage or when arhats who have attained the fruits of realization come to inquire about the Dharma, this master will not fail to clarify the means to illumine their mind ground. This is not known in other teaching. So referring back to Secho's verse, no show of transcendence, but his path was high. If you've entered the great sea of Zen, you should catch a giant turtle. Hakowin's comment on this verse, he doesn't seem inaccessible, but in his apparent casual conversation, there is a cold craftiness. Tenke's comment on this verse, in his everyday work, Joshu didn't use Zen devices, just ordinary interchanges, but his way was paradoxically lofty. This was what I first encountered 
when I attended the class that Shinge Roshi taught, I attended it in 1997. It was called The Healing Breath, now called Deep Presence. And the description I just read is precisely what I experienced. Roshi spoke in a quiet, gentle voice with a very relaxed demeanor and no apparent pushing of any agenda. And the words I heard rang so true. It's like what I always felt inside, but it never had had words for or seen words for or heard words for. The other memorable thing was looking into her eyes. When I looked into her eyes, I felt like I sunk in there somehow and, and her eyes sunk into mine. It's, it's something that I'll never forget, the clear eyes. So as in this case with Joshu, Shinge Roshi acted like an ordinary person. She used ordinary words. Later on, I had many examples of this through the years. The first one that really struck me was when I was sharing with her some problems I had trying to sit through what was a very long sit that DBZ had during session. They had one evening sit that was extremely long. And I remember asking her too about how it was for her to get through it. And she said, you know, how uncomfortable it was. And that was the first time I heard like, you know, the teacher saying, yeah, I was, this was really tough for me too, which to me was such a great lesson, um, much more than if she had, you know, been presented herself like a elevated teacher is here and someday you'll be able to sit like I can. It was just so honest, down to earth, nothing elevated. And then I had many examples after that. In one of Edo Roshi's Golden Wind Zen talks, he spoke about the young monk Umun when he was searching the countryside of China, trying to find a congenial master. And Edo Roshi said that congeniality between a teacher and a student is very important. And he also made the point that each teacher has their own capacity and their own karma. I've heard many members in my role as membership chairman kind of share their experience once they had to move away from Syracuse and thought about trying to find a teacher close to home, to their new home. And they shared the same story that they just didn't feel the affinity they felt with Shinge Roshi. So decided to just remain as our out of town Sangha members and to join us for session. I think about how we have faith in our teachers to help us awaken and also not just in their guidance, but faith. They have faith in our own Buddha nature and our ability to awaken. Uh, Dogen said, and you've probably heard these words, even if wood is bent, placed in skilled hands, its splendid merits immediately appear. Just as in today's case, where animate and inanimate beings all cross the bridge with no hindrance. And in any given moment, our teachers bear witness to our practice when we're really ready to step forward and be vulnerable to, they witness our examination, our doubts. And when we can really allow ourselves to be vulnerable, you know, really, profound things can happen. But that requires time and 
spiritual courage, and as we know, perseverance. But as our, we know that in our practice, we turn towards what is difficult, not away. And turning towards our deepest fears and doubts is really the crux of the matter. So of course we need our, the encouragement of our teachers to help us do this. And sometimes, you know, that comes in the form of a challenge. I'm sure we've all experienced that. We're often challenged by our teacher who can give us honest feedback, help us address our blind spots. And it's been said that, you know, the job of a teacher is to keep pulling the rug out from under us until we no longer fall down. Until we're standing in an unassailable place. And we come to know that we don't need their approval and we don't need anyone's approval to know that we are fundamentally okay. So this student-teacher relationship is multi-layered, it's complex, varied and nuanced as any of our human relationships are. You know, all our relationships have qualities of support and challenge and rewards and frustration, ambiguity, pain. They can all be transformative. But unlike other relationships, this one is one-pointed in service of the Dharma. And the deeper the relationship goes between us and our teacher, it becomes a koan for us. And it can seem like an apparently paradoxical matter, can't be explained or understood or even appreciated with our discursive mind. It must come through our own personal experience. So I deeply appreciate the challenges and sacrifices our teachers make every day, have made every year, decade after decade, giving up the small self to attend to whatever is needed in front of them. We've had some very big examples of that in the last few years with our own teacher here at Home G. Whatever was required, stepped in. And when we think of the challenges that we face with our own practice, with maybe regular sitting, with getting through a session, with um, an officer position, or monastic life, or giving a Dharma talk, we think of these challenges and then think of the challenges our teachers go through and have gone through every day. It's not like they're done and they're sitting up here. Their challenges are huge. And they're endless and they're they're for life. And they never get to a place of done. I also appreciate the way our teachers uphold the lineage from which they came honoring their teacher. They carry it on carefully to the smallest detail. And I was reminded of this this past week, Monday, when it was Indigenous Peoples Day. And I learned, this was for the first time, I learned that many in Native American people develop technology and traditions so they can carry fire from one place to another. They actually carry this protected ember from one place to another. So this mentioned the Pikuni of the Western Great Plains and Rocky Mountain Front. They actually made fire carriers out of buffalo horns to carry these burning coals from one camp to the next. So besides being, of course, very helpful for the people who arrived at these camps, they also served another really important purpose, which was to provide a spiritual and a cultural continuity. The same fire was in camp after camp, and 
these people traveled thousands of miles in their yearly migrations. Same fire. So this spiritual continuity, this bow to their ancestors. Our mandala observance last night and every month honors this same continuity and unity. So I kept being led to doing this today, which is to bow to some of our teachers. I wanna mention some of their words that have been quite memorable to me over the years. You may be familiar with some or most of them. I know everyone has moments when a certain turn of phrase, a certain word strikes you. And it's all with the readiness of time. It's all with the attention we're paying when that word is spoken. And I'm sure you have your own, but I thought I would do this today, which will also be some practice for us in really tuning in and being open to just this one thing, these words. So I'd like, I'd like to invite you to take a moment with each one of these, let it wash over you. But first I wanna mention the Diamond Sutra because I always have to mention this because it was my first like pow. And it was in my first session in, at Hoenji in the Zendo. And the words you've all heard, if the mind depends on anything, it has no true haven. And when I heard that, it was like a lightning strike. I was blown away and had to find out the source. I didn't know this was read at every session. I was like, where, I have to get the source of this, of this sentence. And it makes me think all the time when I return to that, how powerful it's been for me. What if I wasn't listening? You know, the Diamond Sutra is very long. The odds that you're paying attention that openly and closely to every word and phrase are kind of small. So what if I hadn't been fully present to hear that sentence and then lost the power it's had for me over all this time? So that's why I want to do this exercise with you today. And, and really, whenever we hear words with that kind of openness and focus, it's really hearing them for the first time. So I'm going to invite these different teachers into our sendo. So I decided to use this bell. This bell was given to me by Jiraku. Thank you very much. I'm going to, when I ring the bell, you'll have a kind of signal to maybe close your eyes and just focus on the words and then let them sink in for some moments of silence. The first is from the third ancestor, Sosan Kanchi from Faith and Mind, which we read together today. One in all, all in one. If only this is realized, no more worry about not being perfect. This has always been a big one for me because I grew up trying to be perfect. I learned kind of that that's what I should do. And I was always striving to be perfect. It seemed like the right thing. So this practice has done a lot for me. And that statement, when I first heard it, wow, like to let that go, what freedom. You know, when we think of our weaknesses and strengths, Tenzin Pamo said, our weaknesses are not obstacles to the path. They are the path. Also, I remember uh, when Nikyu gave a Dharma talk in our Zendo on a Sunday of several years ago, he spoke about a person who takes music lessons. And he said, the purpose of music lessons 
is to learn how to practice. And I, I had to think about that. I was a music major. I taught music. It's like, what does a music, musician really spend time on? We don't spend time on the measures and phrases that we have mastered. We go back to those that we're having trouble with, our weakest parts, and we slow down and we repeat and repeat. And when I think about that with practice, it's the same thing. Not turn away, you turn in. Now I want to invite in Edo Roshi. These words were in a Tay show on the occasion of the 50th anniversary of New York Zendo Shoboji in 2018, when naming the great vows. However innumerable all beings are, I vow to save them all. Possible? We must save. What is this save? Save is accept. Accept others and oneself as we are. However innumerable all beings are, I vow to accept them all. The next words were from DT Suzuki. Ask and you will be given. This principle holds good with Zen, though there is no giver in Zen and no other than the one who asks. It's what he has possessed himself from the very beginning. Now to Master Rinzai. A moment of doubt in your heart is your being obstructed by earth. A moment of desire in your heart is your drowning in water. A moment of anger in your heart is your burning in fire. A moment of joy in your heart is your being carried away by the wind. If you can realize this, you will no longer be at the mercy of circumstance, but will make use of circumstances wherever you are. Then you will walk on water as if it were land and on land as if it were water. How come this is so? Because you have come to understand that the four elements are like a dream or a phantom. And now we welcome your own Maureen Stewart. We have this source within us, but we must do our practice over and over and over. Sit over and over. Do whatever tasks we are engaged in over and over. Yet nothing is repeated. It's hard to keep wide awake, to keep vividly present in the midst of endless repetition. But look at this, taste this. We may have drunk a million cups of tea, but we have never tasted this one before.
I think of this every time I lift a new cup of tea. It, it never left me. In the same way, in my role as membership chairman, I, I'm asked many questions about the practice almost every day. And as Maureen said, it's never the same question. It's always from a different moment, a different person, from a unique mindset. And that's so true. You never get tired of it. It's never the same. A second part from Yon Maureen. Buddhism is not a set of doctrines. It has no dogma. It just teaches us about becoming Buddhas. It is a way of action, first, last, and always. We must do something with this. We don't just sit around and talk about it or sit on our cushions and gulp it all down for ourselves. We give it away. We radiate it. We must go it on our own on our own two feet alone, yet we are always aware of our interrelatedness. Through each thought, each action, we can help or hinder one another. We take one step at a time, just as in Hindu, just one step at a time. What we do will not be perfect, we know that. But as R. H. Blythe says, perfection means not perfect actions in a perfect world, but appropriate actions in an imperfect one. Next, inviting in Hokuto Sensei, who spoke these words recently. Be simple. Act when it's time to. Help when it's time to. Protect others when it's time to. Do what is needed knowing in your heart what is true to you. Do it without telling stories and leave no trace. Be a person of no rank. Many of us have questioned ourselves during this pandemic about appropriate action. When should we act? How should we act? What will make a difference? Does sitting make a difference? Is it enough? Many people have shared these questions on our Sunday discussion period. I feel like we're really lucky to have this practice because the more we do it, the more our actions will be without self-consciousness. And without self-consciousness, they will be perfect. Physically perfect, morally perfect. That's like the unrecognized merit of our constant practice our constant meditation. Okay, welcoming in Shinge Roshi. These are words in her recent Golden Wind Taisho. When we falter, we can always return immediately. No wasting time on justifying the reasons, telling a story. This is true freedom. Because once we have tasted it, our original mind is always at hand. 
Training becomes more natural. Effort becomes effortless. So it's not easy until it is. From the beginning, there is nothing to do. And now Chigan Roshi in his recent Golden Wind Taisho dealing with the Blue Cliff Record Case 55, Alive or Dead. We live every day. We die every day. No clinging. With each inhalation and exhalation, we live and die again with every breath. Dying becomes equally our activity of living. As I approach age 70 next year, these words have an added layer of meaning, which I never really felt until this late 60s. Living and dying every day. Soyen Shaku, the teacher of Nyogen Senzaki, was once asked to give a talk at a Japanese gathering. The audience had heard about his reputation. They were waiting for this profound lecture to be delivered. And these were the words he began with. I have studied Buddhism for more than 40 years and have preached the teaching here and there, but only recently have I begun to understand it. Now I understand that what I have understood is that after all, I do not understand anything. I read about this, they said, of course, the audience was pretty disappointed. And some of them even laughed out loud. This happened to us in Japan. I was on the first pilgrimage with Shinge Roshi, Taz Kanahachi, the, a number of years ago. And um, we kind of, at the last minute, were invited to a temple we didn't know we would be invited to. And it was really exciting. And once we arrived, we all sat, found a way to sit on the floor in this room and we're waiting and people pulled out their notebooks and pens. And the Roshi came out and sat down and waited a long time and then said, I have nothing to teach. And that was it. Any questions? <laughs> Next are words from Soen Nakagawa in his first talk in America. This we in truth can nothing know, or this I don't know anything, is exactly the point of Zen. We Zen monks apply ourselves day after day, year after year to the study of the unthinkable. And then he made a sound. Who is hearing this sound? We begin to wonder and then deep doubt begins. Doubt and doubt, inquire and inquire, march and march. Ask and ask until you reach the bottom when the bottom is broken through.
Ido Roshi's back, these words in a public meeting at New York Zendo Shobuji in 1974. Some of you think Zen is very difficult, very painful. But you, but you think you should overcome this difficulty in order to get so-called enlightenment. Now, of course, Zen is difficult but it is also too easy. It is neither difficult nor easy. We think too much about this easy and difficult. From various directions, you all came here to this Zendo tonight. On the way, did you think to yourself, oh, this is difficult or oh, this is easy? You should all meditate about this matter of the difficult and the easy and then forget about it. So whatever thoughts we all had when signing up for this session or, or, or traveling to this session, we're here. And Shinge Roshi in a tricycle article in 2006 on the meaning of Nirvana entitled hers, you're already there. She talks about what we're doing here. When there's nowhere to turn, nowhere to run, we discover an inner motivation, a strong determination. I'm sick and tired of this endless round of confusion and fear. I resolve to enter into the clear, awakened mind of my innate Buddha nature so that true compassion can flower, can bloom in my very being. Motivation is so important. If we don't have motivation, of course, we're going to sit there feeling bored, irritated, and in pain. With motivation, we can dedicate our lives. I am here, fully present, and I vow to wake up fully so that all beings may be released from suffering. It's that simple. Bow and bow wholeheartedly and sit down. I love these words because just as in today's case, there's nothing high-handed in the teaching, simple down-to-earth words. You've heard the just sit down and shut up. Simple and down-to-earth. At this point, I'd like to publicly acknowledge Jisho Judy Fancher because she was also a wonderful teacher for me. Whenever I asked for help on practice matters, how to ring the Incan, how to do Joju chanting, whatever it was, she would just, of course, offer herself in such a generous and compassionate way. And also, I learned a lot by just her daily example of living. Her practice was not isolated in one place. It's the way she lived. So I want to say thank you, Keisha. So I feel like we're so fortunate to sit together in session to share this anniversary with all our teachers, with all that they've taught us. And we do this with the strength of togetherness. 
We hold each other up. This morning, as I sat with you all, I experienced a feeling that reminded me of a description of a feeling that I heard a few days ago on the Today Show. They were interviewing a, a woman musician, Natalie Stutzman. She was born in France and was first a contralto opera singer, but is now the second ever female musical director and conductor of, an, of a major American orchestra. I felt quite naive to learn this. I do know that major American orchestras are somewhat generally slow moving and conservative institutions, but I was really surprised that she's only the second female. But during the interview, she was asked to describe what it feels like for her when she's conducting. And I loved her answer. She just took her time and said that everything she does with her body and her eyes and feels with her body and soul, she experiences it as having an impact and feels everyone in the orchestra heading in the same direction. So she said, it's, it's like impossible to put into words, but the same as if you look up at the sky and see a huge flock of birds all flying beautifully in the same direction. And she said, it's heaven. That's what it is. And I feel like practicing here together is heaven. We're all flying together and our teachers are here with us. And this bridge is for all. Joshu's stone bridge, main subject. A monk said to Joshu, the stone bridge of Joshu is widely renowned, but coming here, I find only a set of stepping stones. Joshu said, you see only the stepping stones and do not see the stone bridge. The monk said, what is the stone bridge? Joshu said, it lets donkeys cross over and horses cross over. Secho's verse, no show of transcendence, but his past was high. If you've entered the great sea of Zen, you should catch a giant turtle. I can't help laughing at old Kanke, his contemporary who said, it is as quick as an arrow, a mere waste of labor.